Hello again, my name is Maddie. For those of you who have not seen the previous video, today we are drawing a Gothic cathedral window. If you're interested in seeing how I take reference of, Gothic, of real Gothic cathedral windows and sketch my own designs from them, I'd recommend taking a look at the part one video. A link will be in the description. There is also a written version of this whole tutorial, parts one and two, that will also be linked in the description. If you're here to see how I take the previous Gothic window design sketch and turn it into a full artwork, you're in the right place. Step three, line art. In these next few steps, I'll show you how I usually out render out finished artworks. Obviously, this can be done in many different ways and will vary depend on your preferred methods and the illustration you're using your Gothic window in. Personally, I tend to start by creating a clean line art layer on top of my final sketch. This basically means that I just trace over my sketch for the most part. Sometimes, if there are pieces in the sketch where I haven't worked out all the details yet, I'll go back in and sketch some more before lining, but other than that, it's pretty straightforward. For this particular piece, I ended up using a combination of the turnip pen, which is my go-to for lining in Clip Studio, Bezier Curves, which you can see here for the frame, and the line tool for straight line segments. You can, of course, draw everything by hand, but I find that tends to get a bit tedious, especially in places like the frame, as I mentioned, where I need to keep everything relatively consistent and width all the way around the window and everything the same sort of general size. It's a lot easier for me to just transform the piece beforehand, and with busy curves, they keep their quality, even if you size them up. If you look closely, you'll notice that there are two aspects of Gothic windows that I add in this lining stage that I did not sketch out beforehand. First, I've added more definition to the decorative elements at the top of the arch. In most, goth most Gothic windows, the decorative pieces are made of stone layered on top of a layer of glass, both inside and outside, so the stone sort of sandwiches the glass in between. These stone pieces are most often beveled so that they curve outward from the surface. If you look, take a look at an image of a Gothic window at an angle, which you should have some reference of, 
and you can see how 3D they really are, how far they stick out from the glass surface. The smaller lines I drew in between these existing lines are to represent this shape, and you'll see during the shading section how they help give the piece some more dimensionality. Secondly, I added leading within the glass pane part of the window. These are the lines form the edges around the stone elements and the diamond pattern in the middle. There are many different variations within the glass parts of Gothic window designs. Often they are done with stained glass motifs or repeating patterns like the diamond shape. The leading is actually named after the element lead because that's originally what these pieces of glass pane were held in place with was lead lines because it was easy enough to shape for stained glass windows and stayed in place for a long time. As I said, most of the line art is pretty straightforward, so I will leave you to watch that with some music and jump back in when we get to the shading and coloring stage.
itself, I also added some decorative ivy to this piece. I chose to do the ivy without lines in order to keep focus on the window design itself and not on the plants. Adding lines to anything pretty much automatically gives it visual importance. Our eyes want to focus on things that are emphasized by having outlines around them. Thus, removing the lines from a visual element allows it to recede into the background or feel less important, visually speaking. For the ivy, I used a leaf brush to populate the decorative ivy vines that I drew lines for. This too can be done by hand, but I like the randomness of the brush method, and it, again, takes a lot less time and is a lot less tedious. For those of you that are drawing along with me or would like another foliage brush, I've included a link to a free download of the brush in the description. Step four, shading and color. The way I typically shade images starts off with a layer set to the blending mode multiply. This multiply layer will be my base shading layer. It establishes the general direction of the light source in my scene and any textures present on the object being shaded, like fur, hair, dirt, etc. And you know, all those little nitpicky details. I begin by flooding this multiply layer with a shadow color. Usually medium or light colors work best. I'll then start to erase the shadow away from whatever surfaces the light touches. This is, of course, dependent on where your light source is positioned in your scene and the shape of your objects. It's a little different from traditional shading where you apply shadows instead of applying light, quote unquote. But I tend to find this method works easier for me. So use whatever method works best for you. In this case, I chose to put the light in the top right of the scene, although I did most of the shading with the canvas flipped, so you'll see it go back and forth. You can see I paid special attention to the big window frame during shading, because a lot of the 3D surface or dimensionality of the frame is defined by where the light does and does not hit it. Because there weren't a lot of extra lines in there, I can go in and with the shading and say, okay, this surface is curved, this surface is flat, that sort of thing.
After the first shading layer is done, I add a second multiply layer for the deepest shadows. This includes shadows cast by other objects, like the ivy vines and nooks and crannies of the frame. Basically anything that is facing away from the source of the light, or where the source would be blocked by something else. Pretty straightforward. last stage of shading, though it's a little out of order here because I sort of went around and, and messed with this piece a few times before settling on what I wanted to do with it, is a layer set to overlay on which I paint the highlights. I usually use a very light, mostly desaturated color for highlights, but in this case, because of the way I chose to paint the piece, I went for a bright, more saturated orange. Pretty much any spot where the light hits first is highlighted. Speaking of light, I noticed in looking at my reference collection of gothic window images that I particularly liked the photographs where the glass from the gothic windows was strongly reflecting their surroundings. So in one you could kind of see the tree branches from a forest and another one was reflecting the sky and one was reflecting some of the lights, things like that. Something that made many of the windows look like they were reflecting another world. Thus, I thought a bright, vibrant orange sunset reflection would be a great way to paint this window and make a spooky season appropriate image, because I am uploading this in October. 
given that a lot of Gothic cathedrals were built way before mass production, all of the glass panes that haven't since been replaced, obviously they need upkeep sometime, were originally placed into the leading formations by hand. This means that although most of the glass reflections were accurate, every so often there are panes at slightly different angles, reflecting different amounts of light and slightly different hues. To mimic this, I went in and painted a lot of the major reflection colors very slowly, purposely trying to vary the amount of color I laid down in certain spots, and occasionally erasing some areas as well. most of the final glowing effect for the sunset reflection using a few layers set to add glow. This is a specific layer to Clip Studio, but you can mimic it with something like add and perhaps an overlay layer in Photoshop or other programs. And the sunset I painted with orange, yellow, and pink colors all on top of each other to sort of complement each other, mix the glows together, etc. Deciding on the spooky sunset theme and colors, I also decided to change the ivy leaves to a more autumnal red-brown. I did this by using the tonal correction section under the edit menu and the hue, saturation, luminosity slider, since I wanted to keep the color variation in the leaves that the, the ivy brush originally put down. Shading on the leaves was done similarly to the shading on the window. I used the base leaf color, made it darker red-brown and then drew on a slightly lighter leaf color for basic shading, and then an even more vibrant, light, bright, orangey color to mimic the sunset oranges and yellows present on the glass panes. Since the leaves are a secondary accent piece to the window, I did not worry about being as precise with the shading. And you can see I used the same ivy leaf brush. I turned down the density on it so that it would get some of the base color to show through as well. 
At this point, I was pretty happy with how the shading and coloring looked and decided to move the piece onto finishing touches. So, as soon as you also get to that point, I'll see you again. Step five, finishing touches. Personally, when I'm drawing, I tend to find that I focus almost exclusively on creating and finishing each object or part separately. I complete the line art, and then the shading, and then the coloring, and so forth. And while I try to take into consideration how the whole piece will look when it's finished, the separate pieces do not always merge quite as well as I'd like. This is where finishing touches come in. The goal of this stage is to look at every piece as a whole and tie everything together with extra shading, highlighting, color overlays, and small details like glows or dust motes that bring a little extra life to the piece. For this image, most of the extra shading and highlighting I did was accomplished on a single overlay layer. I used bright yellow, orange to accentuate the light, glowing parts of the image, and a darker navy blue to push the shadows. Overlay is a good layer choice for adding sort of color tints and overall tie-in layers because it tends to go very transparent while still giving a either a light if you're using a light color or a dark if you're using a dark color and a color tint to whatever's underneath it. I also added some correction layers to bring up the brightness, saturation, and contrast in the overall piece. If you're unhappy with how certain things look, now is the time to fix them. At the last minute, I also decided to add in some extra spooky little touches as if there are some will-o'-the-wisp or bits of magic floating around the reflection of what I pictured as a dark forest, at least in my window. You can picture it as whatever you want in yours. And with that, my gothic window is now complete. If you've gotten this far, even if you skipped around a bit, I appreciate your dedication and I hope you enjoyed the tutorial. If you have any questions about gothic windows or drawing in general, I'm happy to answer them. Feel free to post in the comments or send me a message on social media, etc. and so forth. And have a good day.
Thanks for watching.